Good morning and welcome to worship on this eighth Sunday after Pentecost. I have three dates you might need to know. The first one, August 1st for uh, middle school and high school students and their families. We're going to meet at the Buffalo Bill for a day at the beach. So look for more details on where to meet for that. August 8th, we're going to have a big month, I can tell already. August 8th is our church picnic at Brad and Aaron Wagler's. It's potluck style, so bring a dish to share with other people and Brad will provide the meat. And then August 15th, just be right here, we'll be meeting outdoors with our Methodist and Episcopalian sisters and brothers for a worship service that's combined. We'll have lots of participation by each congregation and then join together for a brunch afterwards in our fellowship hall. So those are things I'm excited to have you anticipate and uh, plan to uh, participate in. So with that, let's begin our worship. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the God of manna, the God of miracles, and the God of mercy. Amen. Drawn to Christ and seeking God's abundance, let us confess our sin. God, our provider, help us. It's hard to believe there is enough to share. We question your ways when they differ from the ways of the world in which we live. We turn to our own understanding rather than trusting in you. We take offense at your teachings and your ways. Turn us again to you. Where else can we turn? Share with us the words of eternal life and feed us for life in the world. Amen. Beloved people of God, Jesus who is man from by Jesus who is the manna from heaven feeds you and nourishes you. By Jesus, the worker of miracles, there's always more than enough. And through Jesus, the bread of life, you are shown God's mercy, you're forgiven, and you are loved into abundant life. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. So please pray with me the prayer of the day. O oh God, powerful and compassionate, you shepherd your people, faithfully feeding and protecting us. Heal each of us and make us a whole people that we may embody the justice and peace of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. A reading from Ephesians, the second chapter. Remember that at one time you Gentiles by birth called the uncircumcision by those who were called the circumcision, a physical circumcision made in the flesh by human hands. Remember that you were at that time without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace. In his flesh he has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall, that is, the hostility between us. He has abolished the law with its commandments and ordinances that he might create in himself one new humanity in place of the two, thus making peace and might reconcile both groups to God in one body through the cross, thus putting to death that might, that hostility through it. So he came and proclaimed peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him, both of us have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. The Holy 
gospel for this Sunday is from Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. The apostles gathered around Jesus and told them all that he, they had done and taught. He said to them, come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while. For many were coming and going and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in a boat to a deserted place all by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they hurried there on foot from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. As he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. When they had crossed over, they came to the land of Gennesaret and moored the boat. When they got out of the boat, people at once recognized him and rushed about that whole region and began to bring the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went, into villages or cities or farms, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might touch even the fringe of his cloak, and all who touched it were healed. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Amen. <clears throat> Dearly loved in the Lord, <clears throat> grace, mercy, and peace to you this day from God our Creator and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So Jesus urged his disciples to come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while. And I think that's a word for us as well who have just been through a year of crazy pandemic and the world now is starting to pop up in our lives again and I don't know about you but some and I'm included in this are feeling some stress from this and feeling uh, like there's all kinds of things coming at me right now that um, I just I need what I think of as a time of Sabbath so I'm going to focus today on Sabbath from maybe a little different point of view. Because on this Sabbath day, I would like you to think of your life story in a different way than you might think about it right now. See, we tend to tell our stories from the date of our birth, moving through school, young adulthood, and depending on what your age is right now, we usually tell our story right up to the present moment. But what if we told our stories or even thought about our lives from a different point of view? What if you started by naming your three favorite things or your three, the three best things in your life? Start your story there. Your three favorite things in life. And then I want you to take a step back and ask, what good things happened that brought about your favorite things? So if you were in a group, I'd probably ask you to break into small groups and talk about that. And then I'd like you to take a step back even further from that. And you'd need to unravel what happened before those favorite things came into your life. But what I'd like you to do at this moment is to think about the bad things that have happened in your life in order for the good things that have come in your life to have happened. Now, this sounds confusing maybe, but I'll give you a brief example. And this is from a friend of mine, a campus pastor I worked with at Luther College, Mike Blair. You know, his story just describes this so well because he talks about how much he loved sports when he was growing up. And like a lot of boys, he dreamed he'd make himself an, a name for himself in sports at some point. Well, one day at age 15, he broke his leg badly and had to sit out a season of one of his favorite sports. And he hated that he broke his leg and it seemed like the world had ended because of his broken leg. He hated that he had to miss out on a season of sports. And you know, what you'd wanna say at that point is breaking his leg was bad and wrong. Isn't that true? Well, as he, 
you look back on his life, you also look at this, that a friend of the family stopped by his house while he was recovering, sort of laid up in his leg cast. And his, this family friend brought him a guitar. And he said, you might enjoy learning to play this while you're recovering. The rest is history. Something bad happened. And it brought Mike to one of the most joyful parts of his life his music. And if you knew Mike, you would not think sports. You would think music, which led him to his major in college, which led him to the love of his wife and led him to the love of his career in the ministry. And people that he touched in the ministry loved the music that he shared. It wasn't football. It was music. At the moment any of us is going through in our lives, at any moment, there's a choice, isn't there, in how we respond or how we even name what is going on for us in the moment. Usually we rush to put a label on what's going on. This is terrible or this is awesome. But let me tell you a story that some of you might have heard before. It's a story from a rural place. There was a wise man on the northern frontier of this rural place. And one day, for no apparent reason, um, his son's horse ran away and was taken by other people far away from him. So losing a horse, oh, that's bad, isn't it? And everyone tried to offer consolation for his ill fortune. But the man said, this wise man said, well, who knows? Maybe this, is, maybe this could be a blessing. And months later then, his horse returned and bringing with her a magnificent stallion. And this time everyone was full of congratulations for the son's good fortune to get the horse back. But this wise father said, well, what makes you think this is such a fortune? It might bring something else with it. And then, uh, one day, um, the, the son went out on the horse and was working, and then he fell and broke his hip. And the, and the hip never um, quite healed well, and he became lame as a result of it. Everyone's like, oh, that's just so terrible. What an awful thing to happen. And the father said, well, who knows? Maybe this will bring some blessing, too. And then a year later, the whole area got called up to go to war. But the son, who is now lame, couldn't go to, to fight the war. And he stayed, was able to help feed other people who were at war. And he was able to work uh, again, uh, continue to work with his father. And so that being lame, that had been considered such an unfortunate thing, became a blessing to both him and to his father. So the story reminds us sometimes blessing turns to disaster and sometimes disaster turns to blessing. How can we say that we know exactly how to interpret something at a given moment? I think about this as we're talking about the Sabbath this morning, and I'm hoping that you're also experiencing some Sabbath rest and relaxation. Because I'm gonna ask all of us me included, to take a Sabbath rest from the need to decide exactly what's going on in our lives right now. Because not knowing is also okay. And I honestly think that not knowing exactly what's going on is the space that the Holy Spirit is working on in our lives. What would it be like to take a rest from needing to know, from needing to define everything right now as either good or bad? Like the horse running away in our story, the rush to label or decide that it was a bad thing that happened. Well, that wasn't the whole truth, ultimately, was it? So telling our stories from a different point of view opens us up 
to new possibilities. And frankly, I think these are new ways for us to see God working in our lives. So we could take a Sabbath rest from putting labels on what is going on in our lives or in the lives of our loved ones. Take a rest from labeling what's happening or not happening here at church. And we could be really radical and take a rest from putting labels on what's going on in our country. Oh, this is terrible or this is terrific. So before deciding whether something in our lives is either good or bad, let's just take a deep breath and take a Sabbath rest from the need to know, the need to know right now. And we do t when we do t take that rest, rest, often options appear that we could never have imagined for ourselves, but as I said, become a gift to us from the Holy Spirit. So how many of you, if you have a decision to make or are trying to solve a problem, how many of you really sleep on it? How many of you just let it be for a while to let it sort of sort out, sort itself out? I'm not very good at that by nature, but I have found that when I do let something go for a little bit, the Spirit does have that amazing opportunity to work something new in me. Even writing a sermon, if I just like make myself sit at my desk and dig through books to find out what somebody else said about this topic or that Bible reading, or then go Googling things on the internet, my sermons end up pretty dull then, so you can kind of categorize which ones I've done that to. But instead, if I just write something, write some ideas and then sleep on it, or go wash the dishes, or go water the flowers, it's like something inside begins to unfold. It's like I've left space for the Holy Spirit to reorient what I'm doing or thinking. Sometimes when I do that, I have to hurry back to my computer because after days of not knowing what to say or what to write, it's like a sermon just tumbles out of me that's unexpectedly and usually enjoyable and hopefully to you more than anything. But this really to me is a kind of Sabbath rest to allow time that is not just hard work, not just slogging through, or slaving away at a job to get it done, but it is a Sabbath moment to allow some space for something new. And that could be something new for you as well, to allow that space and let God take over and kind of work in that place where you used to always insert yourself. There are other ways of allowing that space for something new to open up. There was one actor who worked for the great director, Alfred Hitchcock, and he told the story of working with this great director. And this um, actor said that in a movie, they were working on a problem with a scene when that was happening. There were lots of things to consider. There's lighting, there's staging, there's pacing, there's things like that. And he said, finally, when we seemed close to a solution as how we were gonna go forward. Hitchcock would come in and start telling jokes, silly junior high type antics, and got us all lost again. We lost the thread of where we had been going before. And later this actor asked him why, when they were so close to solving the problem. Why did he choose that moment to get us off track by joking around? And the actor said he learned something from Hitchcock that he never forgot. He said, Hitchcock said to them, you are pushing. Nothing good ever comes from pushing. So that is a Sabbath invitation for us all today to be still, to rest from pushing and deciding 
and working hard to figure out what has most been weighing on your mind or my mind. To look and see the goodness of God who knows what we need before we do. It's an invitation to wait and see that with God, your options are not limited. With God, all things are limitless and possible, which we can't see from our earthly point of view. Telling the stories of our lives or our day, you know, our desire is to label, is this good or bad? Did I have a good day or a bad day? Was this awesome or terrible? Doesn't need a label. So let's take a rest from that as well. So take a deep Sabbath breath and let go of deciding something about what hurts in your life right now. Take a deep breath and feel what scares you, but then resist the impulse to put a label on that and a rest from thinking that there's only one way to deal with that. Just be in this moment when you taste the bread that is forgiveness and love this morning. God come to earth just for you. On the first Sabbath, God looked at all he had created and said, it is so good. So wait, pay attention and see the goodness of God. As one author wrote, see that everything we need is already here for us. The solution is already alive in the problem. Our work is not always to push and to strive and to struggle, but sometimes we only have to sit and be still and wait for the Lord. Amen. and sustained by the Spirit, we offer our prayers for the church, the world, and all of creation. Restore your creation, O God. Sustain croplands and pastures and safeguard all farm animals and livestock. Preserve lakes, rivers, and streams that offer refreshment. Revive lands recovering from natural disasters and protect coastlands threatened by rising oceans. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. 
Reconcile the nations, O God. Break down the dividing walls that make us strangers to one another and unite us as one human family. Equip leaders to deal wisely with conflict and guide diplomats who seek peaceful solutions. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Heal your people, O God. Look with compassion on immigrants, exiles, and all who are afraid or feel lost. Give rest to those who are weary, comfort to those who are grieving, and recovery to those who are ill. Send your healing presence to Greg, Tara, Chris, Marlene, Pat, Kurt, Jean, Sue, Judy, Eric, and all those we now name aloud or in our hearts. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Nourish this congregation, O oh God. Prepare a table where we receive food for our hungering spirits. Renew our commitment to provide for one another and revitalize our ministries of feeding and nurturing our hungry neighbors. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. We lift these and all our prayers to you, O oh God confident in the promise of your saving love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So please join me in the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now may the blessing of God who provides for us, feeds us, and journeys with us be upon you now and forever. Amen. Go in peace. You are the body of Christ. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you.